nanoengineering is engineering systems and materials that derive their properties from having small size, from having sizes that are nanoscale dimensions in at least one axis. So uh, that could be the length, width, or, or height that is less than or approximately equal to 100 nanometers. Now, um, that is a loose definition because there are some things that might be 101 nanometers that are still nanotechnology. And sometimes you'll find things with micron scale uh, um, characteristic sizes that are still kind of have effects of, of size confinement. So nano engineer ing I and G stuff that derives properties from size confinement but I already have a squiggle, a squiggle here, which means, which means rough. This is a loose, loose definition. So, uh, so what, is, what are the characteristic scales of things? Um, if, I, if I write here, okay, you can't see if I write here, so I'll stay about here. Everyone okay? If I, I'm not gonna use this board, I'll get into trouble. Okay, cool. 0 0.1 nanometers. One time I went to a talk on nanoscience and the, uh, the seminar speaker used the word nanometers instead of nanometers. And it was my impression that they put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> Nanometers, nanometers, all the same thing. 0.1 nanometers is an angstrom. That's like the characteristic size uh, diameter of a hydrogen atom. One nanometer is a large, small molecule. I'm not confused about the definition of large and small. A small molecule is like an organic molecule like ibuprofen or acetaminophen, a small molecule, but a particularly large small molecule, say beta carotene. Beta carotene is like 35 carbon atoms or something like that, and it's, it's long, it's a large small molecule. 10 nanometers is a large molecule. A large, large molecule. Or a macromolecule. Macromolecule. Or a micelle. Macromolecule could be a protein or a polymer blob, like a blob of polystyrene or acrylic, uh, acrylic polymer in a solution. That would be, have a characteristic size of 10 nanometers. A micelle, a micelle is what is formed with soap and shampoo. So you have these amphiphilic molecules. There's a charged end of the molecule and a greasy hydrocarbon uh, tail. 
And the, what they do is they assemble into these spheres called micelles that solubilize the, the dirt. And then they're soluble, they're soluble because the ionic groups on the surface of the sphere point out toward the water. And then interior, these hydrophobic uh, hydrocarbon tails solubilize the dirt. Micelles are also useful for a lot of things like, uh, like drug delivery nanoparticles, which we'll talk about later in the course. 100 nanometers, this could be like a virus particle. Virions are usually some kind of repeating structure of uh, uh, nucleic acids like RNA, but also proteins that arrange themselves into some kind of symmetric structure, and they're actually like uh, nanoparticles. One micron, micrometer, we never say micrometer, it's always micron, is a bacterium, a single bacteria, bacterium. 10 microns would be like a hair, the diameter of a hair. 10 microns is an especially, uh, is an especially thin uh, hair. So let's say this is a cat hair. Probably 10 to 50 microns is more typical. Yep. So nanoengineering, um, you'll, it falls in between uh, chemistry and material science. And the behavior of nanoengineered systems can be like chemical engineering and bioengineering. So, uh, so, the, so nanostructured materials tend to derive their properties from, um, from, uh, from properties that arise from, from physical principles, often, often quantum principles, but, but quantum or electrostatic phenomena, and also the bonding and structure of atoms and molecules. So physics and chemistry, very important, then nanoengineering, then material science. So this is the way that I think about it. This is not the way that, uh, that UCSD taught me to envision nanoengineering, but this is, this is kind of how I see it. So physics kind of goes into chemistry goes into nanoengineering. And then I'm going to draw two-way arrows between chemical engineering and bioengineering. I feel like I'm in a snow globe here. And maybe material science is somewhere out here. Are the distinctions so texting about nanoengineering. <laughs> the distinctions between these fields are not so, uh, so rigid. There's actually a, a continuum between one field and another. It's just the fact that you have to organize human groups like groups of faculty into like 15 to 30 people. Otherwise, there will be chaos. So we call a department chemistry, we call another department physics, call another department nanoengineering, but, but it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. These are skills that we tend to be, that we tend to have, uh, but it's not, this is chemical engineering, this is nanoengineering, this is bioengineering, this is chemistry. In general, you find that engineers are, 
are better with having interdisciplinary uh, uh, research programs and and uh, and um, uh, 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 the way that they organize their uh, their industries um, than than physical scientists. Physical scientists tend to say that's not that's not chemistry. That's not physics. Um, but engineers don't care. Whatever gets the job done is what we use, right? I can say that because my PhD is in chemistry, so I'm, I'm making fun of myself in a way. Who's heard of Richard Feynman? Richard Feynman was a professor and Nobel laureate at Caltech who uh, made a very famous speech called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And, uh, and that, that was in uh, like the American Physical Society National Meeting, um, 1959. Feynman won the Nobel Prize for quantum electrodynamics or something like that. Plenty of room at the bottom, and what he did was he uh, this this was considered the uh, the breakthrough point in nanotechnology, where it was identified by a world famous scientist as something that was uh, that was acceptable to uh, to study. And he made two challenges. Does anyone remember what the challenges were? One of the challenges, yeah. Mm -hmm. to, write the, to write an encyclopedia on the head of a pin. One twenty-five thousandth of an inch. Um, a size reduction. So, so the first one, that just because of the historical um, interest of this, I'm going to write them down. Um, make an electrical. Oh, I had that reversed, by the way. The electrical motor is one sixty-fourth of a, of a cubic inch, and then the reduction of the encyclopedia is one over twenty-five thousand size reduction. Electrical motor that is one sixty-fourth of a cubic inch, and the page, let's say the encyclopedia, on a pinhead. which is equivalent to one part in 25,000 size reduction. They actually, these challenges have already fallen. They fell in this order. Annoyingly, this one fell within like about a year because someone had super sharp tweezers and they were really good with their hands and Feynman didn't make the uh, challenge difficult enough. So he had to pay out. It was like $1,000 or something like that. A, a lot, like, which is like a billion dollars in 1959. Because <laughs> professors get paid that much. And then number two, the encyclopedia on a pinhead, somebody actually did this uh, with electron beam lithography. Electron beam lithography, and this was in the 80s. And they called him up, they said, is your challenge still Active. They didn't write a whole encyclopedia, but they did write a page of text with this level of size reduction. Um, and what is electron beam lithography? Electron beam lithography is taking an electron beam from a hot tungsten filament and directing it with electromagnetic fields toward a uh, toward a what's called a resist film, which is a thin plastic film on a on a wafer. What you do is you guide this electron beam into patterns on the wafer. And then you etch the, you dissolve all of the areas in the plastic film that were exposed by the electron beam. 
and you can make structures in these plastic films, these polymer films that are down to about um, maybe eight to 10 nanometer line widths, which is pretty incredible. And in fact, that's how the first step in, um, in computer chip manufacturing is actually done by E-beam lithography. So what you do is you take your electron beam and you take this chrome mask, which has this, 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 uh, this E-beam sensitive resist film on it, almost like a photographic plate, and you expose it to all your transistor, your, your, your transistor design and your circuit patterns, and then you etch the chromium under it, then you take that mask and then you do what's called photolithography on a film that's, uh, that's sensitive to light and you project light through this mask that you made by electron beam lithography. And why don't you just make the whole, and you do that 50 times to build up all the complexity of a microprocessor. Now, why don't you just make the whole damn thing with electron beam lithography? And the reason is because it's very slow. So you're just making one letter at a time. It's a little faster than this pantomime, but it's still slow. But photolithography, you just blanket expose the whole thing. Like, click, 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 and they're done. Why is size confinement important? I almost said, why is size confinement important? For a number of reasons. What color is gold? Gold. What color is a gold nanoparticle solution? Red. Orange. What color is, a, is cadmium selenide? <coughs> like silverish. What color are cadmium selenide nanoparticles? Any color of the rainbow. Those are quantum dots because the electron wave function or the, the electron hole pair in a quantum dot are confined in such a way to only allow certain types of, uh, of, of um, excitation energy into the quantum dot and to create an excitation. And then what you're seeing um, uh, is, is either due to absorption of the quantum dot or fluorescence of the quantum dot. And I'll show you in the next couple days some examples of quantum dots and we'll turn the lights out and then I'll show the quantum dot under um, illumination and it will be fluorescent and, uh, and it will be incredible. Trust me. Okay, what are forces, forces acting over small distances? Because something is so small, things like Van der Waals force, everybody's heard of Van der Waals force, become very, very important. So, Two nanoparticles will stick to each other by Van der Waals force with very, uh, very tight uh, binding. It takes, it takes a significant force to pull these materials apart. By the way, something I didn't mention on the syllabus was that my notes that I copy off of from my note into the board into your brain will be posted immediately after class for every class. So if you miss something, don't worry about it. Um, it will all be on the podcast and the notes and they will both be available within the day uh, after, uh, after class. Okay, so forces acting on small particles and over small distances are really incredibly strong. Um, and why, why is that? What are, what are these forces? Forces acting over small distances or between small objects we have the Van der Waals force which was of course named after Professor Force. 
And there are three kinds of van der Waals force. There is the dipole-dipole interaction, the dipole-induced di uh, dipole interaction, and the dispersion interaction. And what are these? Well, if you have dipoles, which are just polar molecules where one side is more negatively charged and the other side of the molecule is more positively charged, and they're spinning around, sometimes they will spin in such a way as to align toward each other, and that will be favorable because positive end of one dipole pointing toward the negative end of the other dipole is electrostatically favorable. That lowers the electrostatic energy of the system. And because of that favorability, some orientations will be more favorable than others. Certainly, some orientations will be more favorable than the reverse, where you have positive and positive poles interacting with each other, which will be energetically unfavorable. So as a result, the molecules will tend to be attracted to each other. Dipole-induced dipole is when you have an oscillating, uh, a freely rotating dipole interacting with a nearby molecule. The molecule does not have to be polar, but it could be polar. And what it's doing is interacting with the electron cloud of the adjacent molecule. And because you have this oscillating, this, this freely rotating dipole that's creating an electric field, sometimes you'll transiently polarize the nearby molecule and shift its electron cloud in such a way to create a dipole using the, uh, the electron uh, cloud. And therefore, the molecules will be drawn toward each other in the same way as with the dipole, dipole interaction. So these are both purely electrostatic interactions. The dispersion force, believe it or not, is the most powerful of the, of the three van der Waals forces. The dispersion force is, has the electron clouds of two adjacent molecules. They could be polar, but they don't have to be. And at any snapshot of time, the electron, which of course orbits in a perfectly circular path around the nucleus, bear with me, Sometimes the electron will be over here compared to the nucleus. Sometimes it will be over here. Now, what does that do but create a dipole in one, along one axis or another? That dipole induces a dipole in the adjacent molecule um, in the electron cloud, and then they're drawn together. Now, if you have two polar molecules, the permanent dipoles and the transient dipoles of the electron clouds are operating on the adjacent molecules simultaneously. So all three of these things are happening at the same time in a polar molecule. The dispersion interaction is uh, quantum mechanical in nature. And electrostatic. Because the orbit of the electron about a nucleus is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. In fact, it, 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 it sort of uses the, the particle version of, of, of uh, quantum mechanics where we have to envision that, the, that there's actually a, a discrete particle orbiting around the nucleus, which, uh, which is how we describe the dispersion interaction named after Professor London. Okay, so this is the van der Waals force. So why doesn't... Um, okay, so we use a lot of nanoscale materials in our everyday lives. So who painted anything recently? I guess that could be considered painting. Uh, drank milk, anything but skim milk. Um, uh, used sunblock. Probably not in this weather, but on an ordinary day in San Diego. All of these things have nanoparticles in them. Ooh. Sunblock, titanium dioxide nanoparticles. If everything, and, and um, uh, milk, milk, milk fat globules, 
and um, paint uh, different types of either organic dye molecules or transition metal compounds, or in the case of white paint, um, titanium dioxide particles as well. Why do we even need sunscreen? Just get the white paint. Um, because they absorb visible uh, and, uh, and uh, ultraviolet light. Why, if, if this is the only interaction, then why don't they just, why, why, why do they remain suspended? Why isn't milk just sold to you as a big coagulated thing that you need to shake up every time? Or, uh, or, 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 or paint. I mean, you do have to mix paint to some extent, but there's not a big block of crap at the bottom that you have to redissolve every time you want to paint something. And the reason is because there are repulsive forces as well, the most famous of which is the electric double layer force. Or the EDL. Force. It can exist in other media, but typically we're talking about it in water. This is why water is a halfway decent lubricant, why you don't want to take a razor and shave your hair or your beard when it's totally dry because it's going <coughs> to cut you up. If there's uh, and, and, if, and, and the reason that, that water is important because surfaces ionize, all surfaces ionize in the presence of water. We'll talk about this in more detail, but what happens when surfaces uh, are ionized is that the counter ions form a diffuse double layer between surfaces in water. And when you push these surfaces together, this cloud of counter ions become compressed. <coughs> and their freedom to move around is restricted by this spatial compression. Now, why does the freedom to move around matter? Well, because their number of available statistical microstates decreases which decreases the entropy, which is bad. So in order to increase the entropy, there's a repulsive force between surfaces that are charged, that have the same charge, and they have mobile counter ions. Incidentally, this is why soap is slippery. This is why you don't want to shave dry. It's also why paint and milk and all those other nanoparticle suspensions ooh, don't. Uh, flocculate or coagulate. My favorite uh, surface tension acts over small distances to great effect. Surface tension creates something called capillary forces. What do you need to make a sand castle? Sand isn't nanoparticles, but they're almost nanoparticles. What do you need to make a sand castle? One, sand. Two, Water, how much water? A little bit. Can you make a dry sand castle? No. Can you make a sand castle underwater? No. So why does water make sand want to stick to itself? Because of surface tension. The way I organized the lecture <laughs> made that a good thing to, to say. Um, OK, so surface tension. Why would it be surface tension? Well, let's picture a surface, gas, liquid, and let's picture a molecule. So we know that molecules interact with each other by van der Waals force. And what they're really doing is they're lowering their electrostatic self energy. So a molecule that has a dipole, or even, even one that doesn't have a dipole, 
it can lower its electrostatic energy if it comes into contact with another molecule so that it can, uh, that it can associate with. Because a dipole and a dipole, even if it's an induced dipole, want to, uh, want to come together. So as a result, you have a molecule in the liquid phase and it's, these arrows represent interactions with all the neighbors, its electrostatic self-energy is gonna be lowered as a result of interacting with all of its neighbors. Thusly, in contrast, if you have a molecule at the surface, at the surface, you're missing some of these favorable interactions because it's interacting with air, but there's not much air compared to the liquid. So as a result, this one is unhappy. So what does that do? What it does is it means that in order to stretch out this liquid, uh, this liquid gas interface, liquid air interface, more molecules have to go to the surface, which they don't want to do because they lose all of this favorable interaction with the bulk, with the bulk water. So as you stretch this out, there's actually a, a restoring force produced by the surface that serves to contract the surface. And that's the origin of surface tension because the molecules at the water, at the water air interface or the liquid air, liquid vapor interface have an unfavorable interaction. So suppose you have two sand grains. And this is a liquid. You have these menisci, this meniscus that forms. This is called a capillary bridge. And there is a pressure that is produced called the Laplace pressure. That sucks outward the way I've drawn it and draws these two solid surfaces closer together. And in the case of bubbles or droplets, these are two contiguous phases. This is a bubble or droplet. <clears throat> There's a Laplace pressure here too, which is pointing always in the direction of the concave interface. So outward in the case of menisci, inward in the case of bubbles and droplets. And the Laplace pressure, PL, which is the pressure difference between inside and outside, is 2 gamma over, uh, over R. This is the difference between inside and outside. Gamma is the surface tension. We're used to thinking about surface tension in terms of liquid water and air, or the vapor that's around air, but this could be any interfacial tension. So it could be the interfacial tension between, say, oil and water, which is really the same thing here like water would rather be interacting with itself than interacting with oil. Even if oil would rather be interacting with water than with oil, which happens to be true. Yeah. I'm 
I'm sorry. So we will talk about this in more uh, detail later on in the course, but basically, if this is a hydrophilic surface, these are hydrophilic surfaces, um, or they, uh, they have a favorable interaction with the, um, with the liquid, the edge here will want to the edge here will want to, um, uh, to, to approach more and more uh, a solid surface to cover it up. I hear a lot of um, sounds like I'm out of time, which I am. So uh, thank you very much, um, and we'll start there on Wednesday.